we're going to go ahead. We are going to go ahead and start because we have a lot of information to share with you and we're sure that you probably have a lot of questions to ask us. So welcome. Just to make sure you're on the right webinar, this is everything you want to know about palliative care. And Gail's going to give you some instruction. So welcome everybody. Um, just some Zoom webinar introductions and um, directions. Um, we have, I believe, disabled the chat and the raise hand tools. So the best way to ask a question is through the Q&A box. You will type your question and s click send. Um, you can send anon anonymously by uh, clicking that box, um, which you see here. Um, once there are questions, if you see a question that you also had, you can like the, uh, the um, original question by clicking the thumbs up icon, and this will help us answer the most popular questions first. So here's what's going to happen in the next hour. We're going to give you one version of the definition of palliative care because there are many versions. Um, and then we are going to have an interdisciplinary panel discussion because that's how palliative care works. Um, that will be the, the focus of most of the webinar. Um, there'll be a brief slideshow just showing you the variety of palliative care programs that are available right here in the Bay Area. Um, but you don't have to take notes. We will send you the PDF later of all that information. And then we'll have, you know, hopefully at least 20 minutes to really answer your questions as best we can and have a discussion, knowing that there will always be more to come on this topic. So the definition of palliative care that we're using today so that we're all on the same page is that palliative care is both a philosophy of care as well as the type of medical care for people living with serious illness. It's focused on providing relief from the symptoms and stress of a serious illness. The goal of palliative care is to improve quality of life, both for the patient and for family members, caregiver, caregivers, and really takes into account not just physical suffering, but mental, emotional, psychological, and spiritual suffering that we know often accompanies, almost always accompanies, having a serious illness. So there's a lot of confusion about palliative care, what it is, how it's ac accessed. Hopefully, we will get to answer your questions about that today. Palliative care is typically provided by a specially trained team, and I emphasize the word team. Um, it includes physicians, nurses, social workers, and chaplains who all work together with any other doctors on the person's team that are necessary to really provide the appropriate support for that person and for their family. One thing to really remember is that palliative care is appropriate at any age, at any stage of a serious illness. It can be provided along with any other treatment, with curative treatments, and really at any time in the continuum of a serious illness from day of diagnosis onward. So, we're just going to introduce ourselves briefly so you know who you're talking to. I will start. My name is Red Wing Kesar. I am a nurse educator at UCSF at the Mary Center for Palliative Care Education. Karen, would you go next? Sure. My name is Karen Young. I am one of the outpatient social workers with Stanford Palliative Medicine. Grant. Hi, I'm Grant Smith. I'm one of the palliative care doctors at Stanford. I'll be talking a little bit later today, presenting information about the palliative care programs that are available in the Bay Area. 
Rami. Hi, I'm Rami Salam, an outpatient palliative care doctor with the Palo Alto Medical Foundation in Sutter Health. Kafuni. Kafuni. I'm Kafuni Mwamba, an outpatient palliative care chaplain here at Stanford in Palo Alto. Thank you. Sarah. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Holland. I'm a nurse at the Symptom Management Service, which is the outpatient palliative care program at the UCSF Cancer Center. And Gail. Hi, I'm Gail. I'm the program manager for the UCSF Mary Center. And thank you to Claire for, um, for organizing all of this for us. And Claire. Hi, <laughs> I'm Claire. I'm a project manager at Stanford's um, Palliative Care Health Education Engagement and Promotion Program. We're really excited to have you all here. Thank you. Yes, this is a wonderful first collaboration between the UCF and Stanford and other palliative care teams. So we're very excited about this also. So the way we're going to start this is by using a case example. Um, I'm going to read the case and then people are going to respond to it just as we would as a normal palliative care team when we get here about a patient. So in this case, our outpatient palliative care team is preparing to see Mrs. Jones for the first time in clinic. Mrs. Jones is a 66 year old woman diagnosed with lung cancer about a year ago. She's been on chemotherapy treatment since being diagnosed. Unfortunately, she was found to have progression of her cancer and the spread of her cancer to her ribs about a month ago. Her oncologist has referred her to palliative care because of worsening pain in her ribs over the last couple of weeks. So I'm gonna turn it over to the panel to say, just from this initial hearing of the case, what would your initial assessment be? What do you need to know more about? What, what information do you already have and what do you need to know? And um, let's just start with Karen. Thanks, Red Wing. Um, so my role as a social worker is to um, provide emotional support, um, as well as some practical assistance for patients and their families, um, to try and connect them with um, things that will make life easier for them. Um, so things that I would be thinking about as I meet this patient would be um, kind of what makes her who she is. So what kind of work does she do? What things does she enjoy doing outside of work? Um, but also things like who is there to support her? Um, is there family or friends? Um, that are helping her out on a day-to-day -day basis, helping her get to appointments, um, organize her medications, things like that. Um, and yeah, are there any additional needs that she can anticipate that she might um, have down the road as she continues with treatment? So those are, those are my first initial thoughts um, kind of as I hear about her. Thank you. Rami, how about you? Yeah, thanks Red Wing. So just um, something on pain management with palliative care, as Red Wing alluded to, you ask 10 different palliative care clinicians how to define palliative care and you'll get 10 different answers. Um, and that's by design. I mean, every other specialty, almost every other specialty in medicine, uh, they take a magnifying glass and look into a specific portion of the human body and organ. Uh, you know, cardiologists look at the heart, kidney doctors look at the kidneys. So they all take steps in. Palliative care clinicians have to take a step back and look at everything, not just inside the patient's body, but above and around and who's there. So um, that's why it's high, hard to define and hard to understand. And one of the quickest ways that I've found to build rapport, to gain trust, and to show what palliative care is about is pain management, because it's one of the leading uh, reasons why patients are referred to our service, and it can have immediate returns. So for Mrs. Jones, who has pain um, with progression of her cancer, we in medical school go through uh, a, a way to assess pain. And that gives us an idea of what, what's causing the pain and also how to best treat the pain with medications and other things. 
So uh, the mnemonic that I like to use is PQRST. Um, P is palliating and provoking factor. So what makes the pain better? What makes the pain worse? Has she tried any medications? Have they been effective or ineffective? The quality of pain is usually when we ask questions about, you know, is it stabbing? Is it achy? Is it burning? Um, is it electrifying? Uh, R is radiation. Does it start somewhere in the body and move somewhere else? And that gives us an idea if nerves are involved because there's a subset of medications that can help with that type of pain. Severity is one that people are asked often. Usually people use a numerical scale from one to 10. I don't. I want to hear more about the story behind the pain. What limits, what does the pain limit the person or Mrs. Jones from doing? It's a big difference um, if someone says, well, when the pain's at its worst, I can only play basketball for two hours as opposed to my usual three hours. Whereas some others will say, well, when the pain's at its, at its worst, I curl up in a ball in bed and can't think of anything else, let alone do anything else. Uh, and then T is temporal, which is, uh, is there any time um, where the pain is worse or better in the day? I like to add one more letter. This is my trademark and I'll add it here. Um, and that's you. Uh, and that reminds me to bring it back to the patient. I want to ask Mrs. Jones, what are your goals for pain control? Um, I've had patients say that I just want to play basketball with my nephew uh, and shoot around without having to stop you know, because of the pain or walk their dog or stand up and cook meals for their children. So to bring the patient, you know, Mrs. Jones into the conversation to set a goal is something I also do in my assessment. Great, thank you, Rami. Kafunyi, how would you respond? Yeah, uh, in, in, in the most part, uh, when uh, people see a chaplain on the team, they are always wondering, am I dying? Is there something serious here that I don't know? The doctor didn't tell me. Because sometimes they associate palliative care with hospice care or end of life care. And sometimes when the chaplain shows up, they, they get scared. They wonder, why am I going to see a chaplain? I'm not ready here for the last rite of their anointing. Uh, and sometimes people respond, I'm not even religious. Uh, you know, why am I going to see a, a, a chaplain on it? But um, I will say that most uh, people living with a serious illness, just like Mrs. Jones, uh, they report challenges to spiritual well being and experience significant spiritual distress. In my encounters, I uh, basically listen to patients' stories of their spiritual religious belief. Uh, as they express feelings of existential concerns, which might be fears, worries, uh, sadness, discouragement, despair, and anyone going through a serious illness go through a lot of losses as well, and the anticipated grief. Uh, but I also explore their sources uh, of strength, uh, hopes, and also uh, you know their connection to any uh, supportive systems or a community uh, of their interest. So in the midst of all this suffering, I assess basically what is important for this patient, like Mrs. Sean, I want to know what is really important for at this point and what brings meaning uh, for these patients like Mrs. Jones and the loved ones, because we care not just for the person coming to us, but also those people who are supporting as well. So a person may uh, not practice a religion because like I say, most people say, I'm not a religious, but you may not practice a religion, but we know that everyone go through spiritual needs. Anyone has spiritual needs. And in my role as a chaplain, I am fully present with the person like Mrs. Jones and uh, or the family or the loved one and uh, also as decision, important decision are being made. So I create somehow a safe environment uh, in which uh, explorations of concerns or expressions of feelings can be shared. So I have to create some rapport with the patient so that they can be able to share uh, those without any judgment at all. 
So what is really true for a patient with serious illness uh, is that they go through total pain as a uh, uh, Red Wing uh, define a palliative care, and that total pain basically encompasses uh, spiritual pain as well as physical pain and psychosocial uh, pain. Uh, this is the reason why uh, palliative care works as an interdisciplinary team for the whole person as a holistic care so that we can be able to uh, assess all dimensions of the person coming to us, not just the illness, but the person that who is having this illness goes through many things that we may be able to address. And so knowing that a serious illness can bring that spiritual distress. Thank you so much. Sarah, as a nurse, how would you? Thank you, Red Wing. I'm kind of glad I got to go last because I think, um, being a nurse on a palliative care team is a pretty special place given our biopsychosocial training. We were trained a little bit in a lot of these other experts' fields. And I think part of the nursing role is to sort of collectively see all of that happening in the patient and making sure that we're accessing the fullness of the interdisciplinary team. So I think a piece of my assessment as a nurse steals a little bit from everybody else in the best way possible. Um, for Mrs. Jones with her pain, like Rami, I'm going to be very worried about how this is impacting her function of life, her ability to care for herself. I'm also going to be paying attention to what the experience of pain means for her, what fears or concerns it may bring up. Um, I'm also going to really want to know how her cancer journey has gone thus far. How did she respond to chemotherapy before the progression? Who else was around her providing support during that time? Um, how is she in terms of health literacy and health education? How much time do we need to spend together talking about medication regimens? And who else helps her with these things to make sure that we're targeting educational interventions to the right people um, to provide the support that she needs? Um, I wanna make sure that she knows how to reach us um, when her concerns escalate or if her pain doesn't get better after our first visit. So I'm going to spend time going over with her how to reach our team, because oftentimes I take the first call, at least in the clinic that I work in. Um, and, and mostly I just kind of want to know what her hopes and goals are working with our team and how we can best support her. Um, and then loop in everyone else on the team to make sure that we're um, not letting anything fall through the cracks. Thank you. Thank you all. I think our audience has gotten a amazing just bird's eye view of of what what palliative care means that people don't don't often get because they don't hear it from everyone on the team. So I'm going to give you a little more information in this case and then go into kind of the next layer of of how you would proceed. So one thing that you didn't know about Mrs. Jones is that she has worked as a regional bank manager. She's divorced. She has an adult son who lives about an hour away, an adult daughter who lives far away in New York. She describes that her son helps her a lot, takes her to medical appointments, um, and she talks to her daughter regularly, regularly about how she's doing, the emotional stuff, but she's taken time off of work for a couple of weeks and she's kind of anxious about that and wonders, am I gonna be able to go back to work again? The other thing is that three days after her initial visit with palliative care, she calls the clinic again and she had started taking the new medication that was prescribed by the palliative care physician but she's having some nausea, she's having some constipation, she's not quite sure what to do, she's wondering what the next steps are. And she's also wondering, is it possible to connect, get connected to a support group for even you know, more support and connection to other people who might understand what she's going through? And we'll start this round, <laughs> the opposite way, we'll start this round with Sarah as the nurse responding to this. Thanks, Red Wing. Um, 
Well, first, I'd probably start by thanking Mrs. Jones for calling us um, because it's really important to reiterate to patients that the, uh, the best thing they can do is advocate for themselves because we really are here to help them feel better and reaching out and saying, I don't feel good is never a bother. It's why we're here. It's why we do this work. So probably start by just thanking her for calling. And then we'll spend a good deal of time on the phone talking about what she's experienced since starting the pain medication. Well, not to get into too many details now, but we'll go through exactly what she's taken and how she's taken them. Has she been taking medications with food or on an empty stomach? Did she start a bowel regimen that was recommended to start with pain medications? Because a lot of them can cause constipation. Um, we'll probably do some reassurance about the fact that a lot of these um, side effects can be transient as adjusting to new medications. And sometimes just a little bit more time can help her feel better. But we'll do a little bit of just kind of nursing, high touch conversations on the phone. Um, during that conversation, I'm going to be listening for any trigger that our initial regimen is not appropriate for the pain, but there are other aspects that she's now talking about. Maybe the pain didn't seem like there were other nerve components at the beginning. But now that we're taking care of some of the pain, other components are becoming more obvious. So I'm going to be listening to see if there are other medications that I think I should talk to the physician about that might be helpful. Um, and we'll go over any other concerns that she's got just related to her symptoms. And then I would loop in the doctor and we'd come up with another plan. Um, while I'm also on the phone, I'm probably going to explore a little bit more about that inquiry into social support and find out what in her life has brought her support in the past? Has she been involved in other support groups? Were they in person? Does she use the internet? Does she have a church group? Um, so that I can be sure to loop in Karen Kafuni um, as appropriate. So that would be where I would start with this kind of initial call and then immediately loop in my other team members. All right, so let's loop in the doctor next. Yeah, I think my mind goes to because we started a pain medication, you know, usually I would set up expectations in terms of potential side effects. And like Sarah was alluding to so beautifully in terms of high touch, um, when we talk about pain and other types of um, suffering, it does often require high touch and palliative care is good at that. Checking in with patients um, sometimes multiple times in a week to see how things are going. Um, in relation to some of the side effects of the opioids, nausea tends to be one that's transient, as Sarah said, um, that people can um, see kind of diminish as time goes by on the medication. Constipation isn't. It's one that stays with patients with pain medications. Um, so I always say the hand that writes the script for the pain medication is the hand that writes the script for the laxative that can help move the bowels. Um, and I uh, also think at this point, um, you know, because she has been out of work, I want to know what's kept her out of work. And if going back to work is something that she really want to, wants to work towards, I usually employ something called a joint visit you know, looping in someone like Karen or Kafunia to, to visit the patient at this time, because that's when we start to realize or recognize, I should say, um, that there may be more than just physical pain going on, but total pain like Kafunia was um, talking about earlier. Thank you. So let's follow that loop. Kafunia, what would you respond at this point? Yeah, just... Uh... As uh, Sarah said and uh, Dr. Rami, um, I uh, met with uh, Mrs. Johnson. She identified herself as not religious at all. And uh, she describes herself as a spiritual. And uh, she, she wonders why this has happened to her. And she did not smoke, rarely drinks alcohol, or exercises, uh, she exercises regularly. And she feels like she has been a good person after all. And she has all these existential questions. And I'm just there listening in my role as a spiritual care provider. And I, I, I want to reassure Mrs. Jones that uh, I support all patients uh, regardless of their belief 
or non-belief. And of course, I, I uh, affirm our feelings um, that it is definitely overwhelming and devastating uh, to Mrs. Jones uh, or anyone really going through uh, uh, to ask this existential questions. And, um, and, and sometimes it's, they are not easy answers uh, to give, uh, just like to Mrs. Answer. So uh, in my role, I just hold patients uh, in that space and, uh, and guide them, and help them to search uh, for meaning and, and purpose as they go through this uh, journey. And assure them, as Mrs. John said, that I want to assure that you are not alone and uh, we are here um, to help you and assist you in any way we can. And we want to work with you as a team um, and accompany you along. And so that you come to a point because everyone, she's going through uh, a denial, not really accepting. It is like a surprise. Um, uh, this happening and she's by basically uh, living there herself and she has a daughter that she calls often on the phone and she doesn't have somebody there with her. She has a son who is an hour away but who, who comes and help her in that sense. And so I uh, want to uh, experience, help her to walk with her and just listen and being there uh, to experience some kind of hope and love or inner peace and comfort. And uh, as uh, research has shown that uh, people going through fear, anxiety, uh, despair, and even physical pain uh, can diminish when somebody feels being heard, being listened to and accepted in the process of coming to terms or coping with uh, serious illness. So I will uh, encourage uh, uh, Mrs. Jones to basically uh, look at the resources she has uh, that will give her the strength uh, to keep going. Uh, right now she has the support of her son and, uh, and her daughter and, and see how, because our role basically as a team, we want to improve the quality of life as well. So if Mrs. Sean just spends, John spend all our time, you know, worrying and, you know, having all these fears of the unknown, what will happen to her and to our children. And so I want to uh, bring her to that moment and to live in that moment and, uh, and be able to find means and ways to basically to have quality time with her son or her daughter. Uh, while she's dealing with this because, and sometimes I want to help her know that the more you worry more uh, about tomorrow, uh, then this steals away the quality of life that you may have. You may not believe to live in the moment because of thinking of tomorrow. And that way steals your joy. And so I want to bring that to the point where identify, assess uh, things that she actually enjoy doing and, and be able to encourage her actually and focus on those things that she is able to do to have some quality of life uh, than just being there, especially living by herself or being alone. It might be quite uh, uh, stressful. And so, and encourage her to find other communities uh, that she can uh, plug into uh, support groups. Uh, and uh, so at Stanford, we have uh, quite a resourceful uh, places that we do if basically given a, a stress level that she might be going through anxiety and maybe suggest some other resources. We do offer like healing touch a sessions that a patient may be able to follow that through eight weeks, uh, once a week. And now I'll suggest those if she's willing to be able to participate and be able to have some uh, community and some sense of uh, relief. And so I will be able to encourage her to look into those resources that I may tap into. Yeah. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And Karen, as the social worker, what would you be dealing with with Mrs. Jones? So definitely a couple of things that I would wanna follow up with uh, Mrs. Jones on is, um, yeah, kind of, 
the the capacity that her kids have to assist her, um, whether or not that feels like enough for her, um, or what what their understanding is of kind of what's going on with her current treatment and where the team anticipates things will go. Um, you know, do we need to you know, include them in any um, future visits with the doctors um, or with our team so that they have an understanding of um, what we're expecting and um, though often family meetings can be a part of, of the care that our team provides, um, kind of including um, the important family members um, that will want to be involved in future decision making. Um, definitely her concern about going back to work and whether she'll be able to um, would be something I would want to address. Um, kind of talking with the physician um, on when we anticipate she might be physically able to go back to work, but also inquiring with her, are there financial reasons that she's um, concerned about being able to return to work? Um, are there health insurance reasons that she's um, worried about that and kind of explaining what benefits she may be eligible for in terms of um, short-term disability or medical leave and how that would protect her health insurance. Um, definitely the following up on her interest in support groups would be important. Um, so like Sarah said, finding out has she done support groups in the past? Is she comfortable online? Especially right now during the, the pandemic, a lot of support groups have transitioned online. Um, is there a particular population or, or patient group that she would feel most comfortable with? Um, so th there are kind of a range of support group options out there. And so we would talk about that. Um, also, is, does that feel like enough emotional support for her? Um, would she like to do possibly one-on-one -on -one counseling with somebody who is um, trained and familiar with what the experience is for patients who have been getting treatment or are anticipating this? Um, so connecting her with those kinds of resources could also be um, important. And then, yeah, also finding out how much has she talked to her family about what her wishes are in terms of the future? Um, are there decisions that she's already made for herself in terms of um, who she would want to be involved in her medical decision making, um, the kinds of care that she would want. Um, so that could be another thing that we would um, investigate as a team, kind of advanced care planning for the future. She completed documents that would share with her family um, what she would want and, um, but also it, kind of facilitating those conversations if it feels uncomfortable for her. These are difficult conversations to have sometimes. Um, and so, yeah, offering up um, our presence um, to help guide those conversations if needed. Okay, great, thank you, Karen. Thank you all. I have to say, I think Mrs. Jones would be like the luckiest patient in the world to have this particular palliative care team taking, taking care of her. Um, but as we all know, patients are having, having a palliative care team as part of your healthcare team does make such a huge, huge difference. Um, it's just such an amazing thing that we are able to offer and hopefully more and more people will understand um, why it's important and when to access it and, and the fact that it is available. We're going to close this part of the conversation really thanking all of you so much for incredible wisdom that you bring to the table here and hopefully that our um, our audience has really understood a lot more about the just the amazing ways that you, that a team is woven together um, in support of somebody who's suffering there are already quite a few questions in the Q&A, so we're we will be answering those. Um, and Grant is just going to give you a brief overview of what the resources are in the Bay Area. Thank you so much, Fred Wing, and thank you to our panelists. That was a really great discussion. I'm really excited for the question and answer session, and we do want to make sure that we have plenty of time for that. And again, as a reminder, please put your questions into the Q&A and upvote by clicking that thumbs up uh, button so that we can know which questions are kind of most pressing for our group here. And we'll make sure to get to those. 
But before we do that, I wanted to present some information about the palliative care programs in the Bay Area. We've told you about this service now, so you might be wondering, well, where can I get it? And so we wanted to help provide some information around that. We have put together way more information about these programs than we have time to present. So I apologize for that, but we are going to be sending these slides out to everyone who registered. So I want you not to worry about kind of all the words that you're going to see on these slides. Think of it as really a reference for you to use after this webinar. I'm just going to go through them to highlight the names of the institutions talk about the locations where they are so you can kind of perk your ears up if it sounds like near where you are. And I'll briefly just mention what services they offer in terms of whether they're both in the hospital on an inpatient team or outpatient, which would be a clinic-based program. And some of the services have home-based programs where a team can come to your home. So we'll go through these fairly quickly so that we have plenty of time for questions. And I'm going to be moving actually north Bay to South Bay, so you can pay attention to, to listen in when we get to you. But first up is uh, Kaiser Permanente Palliative Care serving the Marin and Sonoma area. They have outpatient clinics in Santa Rosa and in San Rafael. They have both outpatient clinic services as well as inpatient teams in their Kaiser hospitals that are located in San Rafael and Santa Rosa. Moving just down the road to Marin, Marin Health, located at Marin General Hospital, has both an inpatient and an outpatient palliative care team. We've got their contact information here. You can reach out to them directly. And again, we'll send this all out. Moving uh, over across the bay to the East Bay, Kaiser has another program and their Kaiser East Bay. Their services are located right in the heart of Oakland, as well as in Richmond. And they also offer palliative care for patients who are hospitalized with their inpatient team, and they have outpatient clinics. All right, we're gonna come back across the bay and into the city. Uh, in San Francisco, our UCSF program has uh, both inpatient and outpatient as well as a home-based palliative care program. They serve patients who are hospitalized both at the main campus at Parnassus, the Mount Zion Hospital, and at Mission Bay, and have a couple different offerings for their outpatient clinics. So UCSF patients can look into these a little bit more after our webinar. The San Francisco VA also has a great palliative care team. They have both inpatient, and outpatient. And they're also unique in that they have an inpatient hospice unit on the, at their location up in the northwest corner of the city. They really serve sort of for uh, specialty palliative care throughout much of the North Bay uh, and they have a large catchment area. A couple more details here on their slide you can take a look at later about some of the unique features of the VA's program open to veterans. Going back into the city, uh, Sutter uh, and the CPMC, California Pacific Medical Center, they have both inpatient and outpatient services. They have several campuses in the city. I believe this is a photo of their new Van Ness campus, uh, and you can get connected with them. They also have a unique home-based program that is a nursing-led intervention called the Advanced Illness Management Program, or AIM. So another opportunity to get palliative care in the home. Our good friend Kaiser also has a San Francisco based inpatient and outpatient programs. Looks like they're in the middle of working on developing a home based program. So there could be more to explore in the coming weeks and months and years there. All right, we're gonna take a trip down 280 in the 101. Down in Palo Alto, we've got our Stanford program. Uh, we have both an inpatient and an outpatient program. Our outpatient clinics are located in Palo Alto in San Jose, and we just opened up over in Emeryville. Uh, palliative care with Sutter in the South Bay. This is Dr. Salah's team. They are a phenomenal team that have a couple different options for outpatient care and inpatient care. 
they really serve San Mateo, Palo Alto, Sunnyvale over on the South Bay, and then also over in the East Bay into uh, Oakland and Fremont and Dublin, and provide inpatient services at Mills, Eden, and Alta Base. And then finally, we'll keep on going down uh, the 101 to get to Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. Uh, located right in San Jose that has both an inpatient palliative care program in the hospital and an outpatient program that's located at the Valley Specialty Center in San Jose. You know, a lot of people are wondering about uh, where to go with COVID. Just know that all of these slides mentioned uh, telephone-based and video-based services, so we are able to see people uh, through using those technologies. We've got this nice summary slide that just shows that we've got a, we're very fortunate in the Bay Area to have a lot of, I mean, national leaders in palliative care throughout the Bay. So a lot of great opportunities. We'll, again, we'll be sending these slides out so you can dive in more information about how to get connected to those services at the institution or location that fits well for you. Thank you again for being here, and I'll turn it back over to Gail, who's going to help to moderate our question and answer session. Thanks, Grant, and thank you all of our to all of our panelists for joining us today. Um, we do have quite a few questions, and we'll try and get to all of them. But um, I think the one that we saw the most is how do you define serious illness? What who determines if a patient has a serious illness? Um, and um, so I'm going to first direct that, I think, to Grant Arami um, as the doctors. How do we define serious illness and who receives palliative care? I'm happy to take a stab at it first, and then Grant can, can uh, add his thoughts. I think, you know, serious illness, it's actually a hot topic in, terms, in palliative care circles, how to define it. Um, one thing that I, I fall back on, and a lot of the palliative care research uses this, is the surprise question. Um, if, if a patient has serious illness, would a referring provider say be surprised if the patient died in, in a few years? The other thing is um, we define life-limiting illnesses. And although with more medical advancements and technologies and great you know, um, research, living with chronic illness is just getting longer and longer and longer. And that's why palliative care is actually coming onto the scene so strong and where we are right now. Um, so often if, if they fit one of those disease categories, be it cancer, heart failure, lung disease, kidney disease, um, HIV AIDS, we, we are able to, to, uh, to see patients. I did see a, a, a question on Parkinson's as well and dementia are big ones that that patients have when they're referred to palliative care. Grant, do you have anything to add about the discussion around serious illness? It's a tough one. That was really wonderful, Rami, and I might just uh, briefly add, you know, I think one of the benefits of palliative care is that we acknowledge that an illness can um, be hard on a lot of different parts of your life. Like we talked about emotional, psychological, physical, spiritual. So I really care think more about like how is whatever the illness is impacting you. And so really any illness can be appropriate for palliative care. And I think we are especially helpful when it's starting to impact multiple aspects of your life. So sometimes I just add in that if someone who's in the hospital a lot, getting coming in and out of the hospital, that's a great person to come see palliative care or whose function and ability to go about their lives is significantly impacted by their illness would be another kind of good person, I think, to get connected with us. Thank you, Grant and Rami. Um, next are, what are the key differences between palliative care and hospice? And Karen, can I have you start with that? Sure. Um, so one of the key differences is um, kind of the eligibility for hospice. Um, is that you do have a limited prognosis. Whereas with palliative care, you can be at any stage in your treatment. You can be newly diagnosed, um, but having difficulty coping with that diagnosis and be referred to palliative care. Um, you can still be getting curative treatment and see our palliative care team. Um, whereas with hospice, you um, typically patients have made a decision to focus on their comfort and not seek any more curative treatment. Um, another big difference 
is that hospice care will be delivered to you at home or wherever you feel most comfortable. Um, whereas with a lot of palliative care teams um, that don't do home-based services, we're still gonna ask you to come to our clinic or be seen on video. Um, and we may be limited in terms of how much we can assess you um, at home. Um, hospice teams also have typically a 24 hour nursing hotline. So they can be available in the middle of the night if something were to change in, in the patient's condition. Um, whereas a lot of palliative care um, services are provided you know, during working hours in the clinic. Um, and so uh, you may have to wait until the morning to call and, and speak to a nurse um, if something changes overnight. So those are the things that come to, to my mind. I don't know if Sarah has additional um, things that she's thought of. <laughs> I didn't cover. No, I think that's a really good, um, a really good overview. I, I think that, you know, with hospice, as, as Karen said, when we talk about a, a prognosis change, it's usually um, if at least two physicians agree that the patient likely has six months or less to live as long as the disease runs the course that we're expecting it to. Be aware though that a lot of people are alive a lot longer on hospice than six months because hospice care though not palliative care is exceptional and oftentimes people thrive really well on hospice. Um, and around curative treatment, uh, you can't be on curative treatment if you're on hospice. Um, and I always get a little bit concerned about the curative label because I think we're really talking about disease-directed treatments because there are a lot of disease-directed treatments that are not with the goal to cure, but to control and manage a disease that is serious and life-limiting. And those types of therapies are not covered on hospice. So that's kind of a big wall there between whether or not you're eligible for hospice versus palliative care. And I think the goal with palliative care is to get started as early in the disease as possible um, because we can form a relationship when you're still feeling good. We can get to know what your hopes and dreams are and we can really walk with you through this journey and help you along the way. Yeah, I, I, I will also add that uh, some, some patients actually, when they come to know what palliative care is, and uh, they always wonder why they did not get referred to palliative care team early enough. And, uh, and because for others, they thought that palliative care was hospice care. And so I thank uh, Karen and Sarah for defining the difference between the two, uh, because that's most patient. So they wonder why they, they didn't get the referral to palliative care on time, because you can refer the, the time that you are diagnosed with serious illness, and you can start from that moment. And so they feel good when they meet our team, and they, as you can see, very interdisciplinary team, and they feel like, oh, I should have, why I should have met you maybe two months ago when I was going through uh, all of this. So it shows like, uh, uh, that's that's it's important. They want to be referred earlier enough as well. I will add that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, sorry, I'm losing my track of what question we're on now. Um, how can we help patients who say they're not ready for palliative care um, receive palliative care? Is there anything we can do to? help them into, um, into our practices. And anybody who has an answer for that. I'd say it depends on what the reason for their hesitation is. So I think investigating that would be important. I think there, there sometimes is an initial resistance just to the term palliative medicine. What does that mean? So sometimes just defining what palliative care is that you can receive it at any stage in, in treatment can help um, bring down that wall. Um, I've worked with physicians who like who prefer to refer to palliative as symptom management because that seems safer or more comfortable sometimes um, to, folk, to emphasize that it, it can be um, more around symptom management than end of life care um, or anything related to being at a certain stage in your treatment. Um, so initially starting off with, this is a way to really aggressively manage your symptoms um, can, can be an easy in. Thank you for that. 
Um, Kafuni, um, there are a couple of questions about um, how uh, chaplains can handle patients who have different religions um, from them, or isn't it better to have a chaplain who has the same religion as a patient? How do you deal with those situations? Yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, yeah, normally we are trained as chaplain basically to care for anyone, regardless of religious uh, belief. Uh, but there are moments where that, uh, that patient will need certain uh, religious rituals uh, done by uh, a person from that religious belief. And here at Stanford, we are so blessed because we do have a very diverse spiritual care team. And uh, we do have everyone represented. And so if it comes to that uh, specific needs uh, of a patient requiring or wants to be anointed by a Catholic priest or a Buddhist monk uh, and, uh, find those, and I'll be able to make a referral to my colleagues uh, that who are part of uh, our spiritual care team. And we do have a representation of every religious belief you can imagine here at Stanford. So I'll, I'll make a refer to my colleague who can be able to follow up to provide uh, the specific for that religious team. Great, thank you. Um, and then there is a broad question about um, how palliative care teams work, how they come up with their treatment plans and do the treatment plans include things that are like non-pharmacological treatments um, such as meditation, yoga. Um, do you consider um, durable medical equipment um, when you're coming up with your treatment plans? Um, and I'll let Grant and Rami um, address that. Um, I'm happy that that person asked that question, um, especially in the vignette that we had with Mrs. Jones earlier. Um, yes, uh, pain is not only physical, and it's often, um, I've seen it firsthand when we, we kind of hone in on the physical and think medications is the end all be all, but a chaplain or a social worker comes in to have a conversation to talk about God or talk about other um, uh, types of suffering where those needs for medications actually go down. So it's important to use um, a multimodal approach and non-pharmacologic treatments to help, be it acupuncture, medical cannabis, acupressure, meditation, massage, yoga, exercise. Um, and really uh, speaking to the human nature of us all, just maximizing the, on the things that bring us joy in our day. Um, to help with the pain that that um, the patient is having. Um, so yes, absolutely. We use uh, an arsenal of, of pain directed therapies that include medications and then also non-pharmacological things. Grant, anything to add to that? Totally agreed. I, exactly. I think we just always try to meet uh, the individuals we're meeting with where they are and how they feel about those different types of interventions or medications. And it's always a conversation. I, I take the exact same approach as, as Rami. Okay. And how do the teams coordinate? Um, how often do you meet to have kind of, how often do you round on, on your panels? Um. Just as there's high touch between the team and the patient, there's also even more high touch within the team. Um, so I'm often, um, you know, throughout the week talking to our nurse or our social worker, a chaplain, et cetera. But we do have dedicated times, at least for our clinics, um, where we have an interdisciplinary round where we go talk through patient, talk through um, all of our patients and see what's come up, what's not come up. Um, and all the disciplines are, are represented during those rounds or those meetings. Yeah, and here at Stanford Palo Alto, in our outpatient palliative care, we do have adults every morning. Uh, we actually meet every team member, come together and we go through the list of the patient that we are to see and uh, we are able to locate that. We send them SS, uh, a survey that to look at uh, what they are, how they are feeling at that moment. And then we see we can make a joint visit together uh, based on uh, the responses or how they feel. Uh, if they have sadness, worries, and fears, 
and or, or other practical needs. And then we can see a chaplain can join a physician or a social worker as well. And so we, we work that together and join them together based on those, the feeling, the needs that they have for the day. And we can all come together as a team. So we meet every, every uh, morning and then throughout the day, we, we coordinate as well. Uh, we do referrals to each other who was not able to join and to see, to follow up or to visit as well. Um, Bradwing, we had a question about um, how end of life doulas, um, about end of life doulas and whether they uh, participate in um, these palliative care teams. Oh, that's a big can of worms question. Uh, so, an end of life doula is not officially a healthcare provider in this world. It's kind of a new field of lay providers who have a variety of different levels of training in how to assist people and their families at the end of life. Um, it's not it's not anything that produces a license or an official di uh, designation on a team. So I would say in terms of palliative care, um, doulas are really focused on end of life care. And sometimes if a palliative care team member or a hospice care team member, you know, knows that a patient and family needs more help, more handholding, there is actually a registry of doulas in the Bay Area that is accessible. You can Google it. Um, but they're not they're not an official part of our teams because we're talking here about palliative care as part of the healthcare system. So they're kind of an adjunct to care. And um, again, it's just, it, it's a challenging field at the moment because it's just starting to open and the National Hospice Association is trying to figure out some regulations and standards of care that would apply to do end of life doulas, but that hasn't happened yet. Great, thank you. Um, and finally, there were a couple of questions about um, palliative care outside of the United States. Um, you know, how is it handled? What is it called? Is it still called palliative care out, um, internationally? Um, and anybody who might be able to answer that, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I would say, for instance, in UK, uh, they have tendency of uh, palliative care, they associate it with uh, hospice care. Uh, or end of life care, like uh, Reading said. So that's in the UK, they, it's an interchangeable terms over there, uh, which I found uh, quite different. I know internationally, uh, just as, as palliative care is picking up in the West and in, in the US, um, uh, all around, you know, I, I go down my Twitter feed and I follow a whole bunch of folks from different countries um, with interests in palliative care. Uh, so yeah, it's there. Uh, I know in Arabic, for example, the word for palliative comes from gentle and uh, how they call it uh, as a specialty over there. Um, so yeah, it's picking up. Uh, and one thing I, I wanted to just make sure we answer before we go, because I saw the question in terms of payment for palliative care and coverage by insurance. And most programs, if not all, are, are covered by insurance to say, by for doctor's visits, just the way as it is if you go see, if you have a co-payment for your cardiologist or, or oncologist, it's the same with palliative care. And that's, at least for us, holds true with home visits um, or office visits or video visits. Um, so thankfully uh, it, it is covered, it is a program that's covered by insurance in terms of payment. Yes, thank you, Rami, for sure. Um, so home, telehealth, home, oops, sorry. Go ahead, sorry. Sarah. To add something, sorry guys, I got kicked off. I love Zoom these days. Um, but one of the things I wanted to also make sure that we said before the end of this is that we spent a lot of time talking about all the members of the palliative care team. And we didn't mention probably the most important member, which is you guys, the patient, the family, you are part of this team and you're the most important piece of the work that we do. And so I think that that's something that I hold very dear to the work that I do. And I know all of my colleagues on this panel do as well, that please keep in mind that you are also on this team when you partner with a palliative care team in your journey. 
and your voice will always remain the most important to us. Perfect closure for this webinar, Sarah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. We want to be respectful of everyone's time. Thank you so much for joining us today. As Claire said at the beginning, everyone who registered um, will be sent the slides so that you have the information and we'll include, uh, you know, websites um, for our various programs, those of us who are on this call. Um, keep thinking about it. Keep having conversations about it with your friends, your families, your medical providers. Uh, ask questions about palliative care, ask to be referred to palliative care if you think it's appropriate. And thank you, thank you all for attending this. Stay safe.